This is Closer to the Fire from the Voice of the Martyrs Canada with a focus on the persecuted church around the world. I'm Greg Musselman. Across the Russian Federation, Christian activities that include gathering for worship, distributing Bibles and Christian literature and personal evangelism were all investigated by Russian police and punished as crimes by the Russian courts of law. Now, believers paid fines and when they appealed their decisions, in most cases, they lost those appeals. And it is a trend that is happening right across Russia and is being monitored closely by our friends at the Voice of the Martyrs Korea. And joining me to talk about the opposition the followers of Jesus are facing in Russia is Dr. Eric Foley, who is the CEO and co-founder, along with his wife, Dr. Hyun Suk Foley of the Voice of the Martyrs Korea. And they support the work of persecuted Christians in North Korea and also in China and Russia and right around the world. Dr. Foley, welcome back to Closer to the Fire. No, oh, thanks for having me, Greg. It's an important issue for us to talk about and one that Christians in the West really aren't as familiar with as, as they were during the times of communism. Yeah, and, and it's we're going to explain exactly what, you know, Voice of the Martyrs Korea, Russia, we'll explain how that all works in just a couple of moments. But before we get into the situation that Christians are facing in Russia, how has the invasion of Ukraine, how has that affected the evangelical church in that country? Yeah, it's it's raised a number of really challenging issues at a number of different levels for Christians. Uh, for one, the relationship between Christian denominations in different countries that were formerly a part of the Soviet Union has been strained and in many cases simply broken. So uh, Pentecostals, for example, or Baptist in Russia, uh, their communication with um, their, uh, their um, denominational uh, compatriots in in Ukraine uh, has has really f uh, faced serious difficulties and in some cases simply fractured. And it's not only in those countries. Of course, we've seen similar issues in in Belarus. We've in, anywhere that there is um, there there is Russian activity. Uh, Russia has a way of calling the question for especially for Protestants to ask the question: Are you loyal to this country? And the basic presupposition of the Russian government has been. Uh, that that's something that that Protestant Christians have to prove. Uh, it's it's there, there, there's no presumption in their favor. So when we look at now Article 19 of the Constitution mm -hmm. of the Russian Federation, it guarantees equality of you know rights of all the citizens. And again, we've seen that all over in our work yeah, sure. all around the world. Like yeah, we yeah. Have freedom of religion, but then in reality that doesn't happen. But when you look at what's going on right now in Russia. Uh, why are Christians, especially evangelicals, and we'll talk about the yeah. Russian Orthodox Church in a moment, but primarily evangelicals, are they seen as disloyal? So as you pointed out, Greg, uh, even North Korea uh, has the freedom of religion enshrined in their constitution. As the old saying goes, the devil is always in the details, you know, kind of quite literally. The, always the, the big caveat, the big however uh, the limiting factor of religious freedom in countries, whether whether it be North Korea on the extreme side or uh, Russia, um, which, although less extreme, is is, is still uh, we're we're seeing some noteworthy challenges there. The issue is is that freedom of religion is always constrained by questions of loyalty to the state, right. and any time that there is a perceived threat to the state as a result of whether that be supplying information or intelligence activities, whether it be related to, to questions of loyalty and trustworthiness, military conscriptions, all of these things are issues that cause freedom of religion uh, to be uh, viewed in a secondary light uh, compared to the ultimate issues of the, the safety of the state. So in the case of Russia, you know, you've got denominations that historically have been what we call pacifist denominations that is part of their theology. Right. They don't uh, they, they don't engage in military activity. Well, that automatically puts them a suspect in a situation where you're in a conscription environment. And so um, if young men are not uh, eagerly signing up to defend Mother Russia, then the question is, uh, what do they really think or feel? And in the cases of denominations that, in, that used to enjoy great relationships um, between countries, Russia, Belarus, um, Ukraine, and in the other former CIS countries, then those strong connections become suspicious to the Russian government. Okay. So um, in, in a country like Ukraine, 
since 2014, of course, uh, Russia has, has been present there in the Donbass region and in Crimea. And so um, that's meant different things to different denominations, Greg. Registered Baptists face different problems than unregistered Baptists. And when you think about the territory that changed hands, you have Baptists that uh, used to be a part of, they were registered in Ukraine. Now they're a part of Russian territory and uh, or Russian occupied territory. And the Russian government is saying, well, why are you registered with Ukraine? Of course you have to re-register with Russia. And what, if, wouldn't you want to do that? And so you can see that there's just a whole host of questions that, um, that, that raise a number of challenges. And unfortunately, one of the effects of that has been to raise suspicion and fracturing within denominations across borders, even within the same borders. Uh, there, you know, of course, uh, Ukrainian Christians have raised real questions and concerns to say, hey, why aren't Russian Christians, especially Protestant Christians, more vocal right. in opposing Russia's military activity? Russian Protestant Christians have dealt with that in different ways. Um, they, you know, uh, for the uh, for for many denominations, they've dealt with that by being silent, and and Ukrainian Christians have taken that as 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 being complicit in Russian activity. So, yeah. you know, Russian Protestants are facing accusations from all, all sides. Right? It's not just yeah. their own government. It's Ukrainians. It's it's other Russian Christians, and these are complicated and difficult issues. And so that's the environment in which these legal issues should be viewed. I mean, it's tough being a Protestant Christian in Russia. There's just, there's just a lot of difficult issues to address. Well, you know, just listening to you talking, I mean, thinking, how would I function in that kind of setting? Because yeah. there's so many, of course, we know in Russia, Christians and not Christians, uh, non-Christians, that they are in that place where they're saying, like, this is... Uh, a bad war. We we don't agree with this. This is a takeover, and uh, we're against it. But if you speak out, then you can be imprisoned. Or if you decide that you don't want to go into the military, uh, you can be imprisoned or worse, tortured. So how do the Protestant evangelical believers uh, in Russia, Eric, how are they able to you know continue to do what they want to do, which is evangelism? We talked about it earlier that uh, they're finding themselves in trouble. They're being fined and they're being you know monitored. I mean, how are they even able to continue to do? kingdom work only by the grace of god i'd say greg that's certainly true of all of us but it's really evident in russia today you know um this we we noted a number of recent um uh, court cases that were decided uh against christians and unfortunately even on appeal um those those convictions were upheld but this is not just a new issue that started with the war. I mean, this goes back uh, now for the better part of two decades. It's right. simply an advancing trend. It began with raising questions about Russian Protestants' connections with foreign missionaries. And um, the emphasis there uh, for the Russian government has always been on the foreign part rather than the missionary part. So we went through periods where foreign missionaries had to register. We went with periods where that registration resulted in restrictions. We've now gone through periods where association with foreign missionaries has been criminalized uh, by the Russian government. So it's not just punishments for missionaries, it's punishments for, for churches and Christians associated with missionaries. I think that the alarming thing that we've seen, though, in the last year is now we're not just talking about association with foreign missionaries or foreign denominations. You know, the cases we highlighted, and we, highlight, uh, we highlighted with Voice of the Martyrs Canada, five cases over the last year where these were not people who were having contact with missionaries. These were individual Russian Christians who, in some cases, they, they owned shops like a locksmith shop. And, uh, and they were in, the, in their locksmith shop, they, they, were, they, they had like a little rack where they were handing out Christian newspapers, hmm. right? So... Um, they weren't forcing these down anybody's throat. You know, the the um, the newspapers are completely non-political. They're simply they're simply gospel media. In fact, those companies, those publishing companies, are registered with the Russian government, and so th these are not subversive periodicals. Yeah. But what the Russian government did in each of these cases was to say, no, it is not permissible for you to display these um, these um, evangelical periodicals it's not permissible for you to offer these to customers you're 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 doing it in a way that it, you're not licensed to do you're a locksmith you're not a church and so those are the issues is that you know for some russian believers of course going all the way back to their heritage under communism and of course in some cases even earlier the um 
their 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 way of worship has been to use their homes. And so um, their homes are not registered as churches because these are what are called unregistered churches. But now the Russian government is saying, well, no, you can't do worship in your home unless you're registered as a church. So that's viewed as a subversive activity. And so this is where, again, we're seeing all kinds of limitations on uh, the freedom of religion that's guaranteed in the Russian constitution. We're seeing that accelerate. We're seeing it broaden out across the whole country. And we're seeing it deepen to now it's, it's, it's not just you know, groups that are trying to go out and evangelize in public. And, and that's, of course, a very common activity still. Groups of God, they'll play in like even a brass band and they'll they'll do a public preaching. And that'll sometimes get you in trouble in certain parts of Russia. If you go out and you you you, you don't have the right permits to do that activity or, or you're an unregistered church. But now the, the amazing thing is just ordinary people in their own businesses displaying um, literature that's registered with the Russian government that is now a criminal offense. And so it's, I, I think that the how Russian Protestants are responding is they're saying, hey, you know, if we just go to court and we just clarify that, we, we can make people understand we're not being political, we're, we're not handing out unregistered material. So they were hopeful that in going to court, it would be decided in their favor. What a shock for them yeah. that even with all of the evidence clearly displayed, even, even, even after a decision is made, going back on appeal, that the decision has stood to say what you did, you cannot do any longer. And they're not, it's not like they're going on social media and, you know, speaking out against uh, Vladimir Putin or what's going yeah, on right. in Ukraine. As sure. much as they, you know, feel that uh, that, in, that it, it is you know, an invasion and, uh, yeah. you know, many lives are being lost, Russian lives as well as Ukrainian lives. I mean, it's a horrible situation. Are, are the Russian authorities, are they getting, uh, are they looking at China and some of these other countries, the way they oppress uh, evangelicals, you know, in terms of the way they're clamping down and then just putting up so many roadblocks uh, to do anything in advancing the gospel? Sure, there there is clearly a parallel between Russia and China and the state establishment of religion. Okay. Both those countries are very comfortable with that concept that and can justify it openly. It's it's not a hidden issue. You remember under the Soviet Union, uh, Russia would often invite people to Russia and say, hey, look, you can go to this Baptist church. There's 600 people there and we're not putting any pressure on people. That This is, this is simply being open that in Russia and in China, uh, what's being said is, of course, there should be a relationship between the church and the government. Of course, we should expect that the church should play a role in in establishing good citizenship and in upholding prayerfully the decisions of the leaders in su supporting the activities of their country in exercising patriotism. That is the open language. It's So it's very different than uh, under communism when the idea was, hey, let's deceive the West into claiming that we have religious freedom and behind the scenes we're clamping down. This is a very open statement of saying, hey, theologically, here's our justification. Politically, here's our justification. We think that church and state should be working together. We think if churches are not willing to commit patriotically to the aims of this country, of course they should be subject to penalties, punishments, restrictions, surveillance, and so forth. So th that's a real challenge, isn't it? So, I mean, that's a very different challenge than we faced under communism. And I think that's what makes it harder to address is that... Um, you have many Protestant Christians who, of course, would say that they love their country very much. There are certainly um, uh, Russian Protestants who are who are vocally opposing the war or doing that in, in various ways. But as you point out, that's not what we're talking about here in these cases. These are not five cases of churches or individual Christians who oppose the war and face the consequences. <laughs> these are people who are handing out, like, you know, just like you would think of a magazine like I'm not sure I'm, I, I you know I'm trying to think of what would be popular in Canada but you know like our daily bread or guideposts mm -hmm. or whatever this sure. is kind of yep. you know devotional things here's how to come to know the Lord Jesus I mean these are not political journals seething with uh you know uh, subversion and so uh yet the idea is the logic of the Russian government is okay yeah but you're not registered and that makes you suspicious especially at this time. And it's it's not enough to not speak out against the war. Why are you not being supportive? Why, you know, so the expectation now for Russian Protestants is, hey, you should be 
doing things to tend to wounded soldiers. You should be uh, gathering materials and sending them to the soldiers and so forth. And of course, that puts the church on the horns of a dilemma. What did they do? These are their sons and daughters. And at the same time, does that support the war effort? And, and so it, it has led to a lot of difficult conversations and very difficult disagreements between Christians in different countries. Those wounds will last for some time and they show no signs of healing quickly. Yeah, it, it's a difficult situation. And you're, you know, you're right. It's even dividing, you know, Christians from other countries. You think of Ukraine and of course Russia. And then you think yeah. of even internally within the country. How does the Russian Orthodox Church uh, factor into this? Because, you know, I'm thinking of China. Of course, they have the government churches, which is the three self-patriotic churches and the mm -hmm. self-patriotic Catholic churches. So they're controlled by the government. And even they're having uh, challenges these days. The Russian Orthodox Church is seen as the state church. So how are they involved in this process? And are they getting a, a pass And when the evangelicals are not? Yeah, you know, um, this is a question that goes back decades and involves the, the whole process of change that took place in post-Soviet Russia. And many people, I think, still have the mindset that it's 1992 and that Christians from the West can come and go freely and engage with their brothers and sisters in Russia and, and evangelize without consequence and, and do mission work and so forth, and that all denominations are on equal footing and that the government is, is fine with that. That's simply not the case. I mean, you know, we, we now we've seen in, in, the, in the popular media or mainstream media, we've seen more uh, awareness accurately that um, the, the, the Russian Orthodox Church enjoys not only a pride of place in Russia, but in some sense to be Russian is to be Orthodox. So to not be Orthodox is in some sense not to be Russian or mm. to be less Russian, or at least to be kind of a suspicious Russian. Uh, conversely, you've got now still in Ukraine, you've got now the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, but then also the Russian Orthodox Church and accusations going back and forth about the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in hiding uh, Russian military officials or money or, uh, uh, or weapons even. And so that's why, you know, none of these things can be spoken of in just a kind of a generic way. What we can do is simply note that these challenges exist. And so um, the, the Russian Orthodox Church is not in the least bit hesitant at the levels of its leadership to indicate a very strong support for um, the war and the policies of the Russian government. There's no, not only is there no hesitation in that, it's, it is obviously regarded as a holy war. The, the, the you know, Protestant denominations that are historically pacifists who are against any kind of bearing of arms uh, then are automatically suspicious. And then you've got, as I say, these groups where uh, prior to uh, the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, they operated without friction. These denominations freely shared people, planted churches in each other's jurisdictions. And now they're saying, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Isn't this suspicious? Isn't this wrong? And so, you know, one of the things we definitely have to pray for, Greg, is for the mind of Christ to bring clarity to those groups, to treasure their uh, joint um, position in the body of Christ, even above their love for their country. So um, we're at a time when, of course, and that's 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 an issue in the West as well. This this concept of Christian nationalism, that our relationship to our nation and our relationship to Christianity become blended together in ways that um, bring new questions, concerns, and challenges. So um, that's those those issues are are um, now being decided, you know, at the point of a gun or a missile in Ukraine and Russia. And it doesn't, it doesn't, let's say it doesn't bring a whole lot of um, uh, space for, for good, solid theological and biblical yeah. reflection. And I know part of the reason that uh, the Voice of the Martyrs Korea is involved in Russia is the important part of discipleship. And I know that that's you know, been your passion for many years, whether it is in North Korea uh, or even in the country you live in yeah. now in South Korea, in China and Russia. Talk about the importance of discipleship at this time. And sure. as you mentioned, I mean, I'm just getting my head is spinning when I'm yeah. thinking about if I was a Christian in Russia and you've got this invasion of your country into a sovereign nation in Ukraine, you've got the state church. And if you're not a part of that, yeah. you're seen as suspicious. Evangelicals, for the most part, are seen as Westerners, or at least sympathizing with the West. The, then you division within the evangelical church. I mean, how... Eric, are you able to go in uh, with resources? I know physically if you go in, but sure. with the resources <laughs> to help mature the church because 
you know, when the when the Soviet Union fell apart and so much, you know, Bibles and teaching, mm-hmm. and I mean, there was some not so good teaching that went in during yeah. that time. It's just like a flood. And now you see all these years later, uh, the church is struggling. So mm. how are you able to help our brothers yeah. and sisters in Russia grow in their <laughs> faith and realize that their citizenship is not there? You know, it's not Russia. They, they love the country. Our citizenship is in heaven. So how do you how do you ha- make that happen over there? Yeah, Greg, you, you said it's a head spinning question, and it is. I mean, you can look at all of the different decision making axes that are involved in that. You have pacifist, non pacifist, you have registered, unregistered. One we haven't touched on so far is language. You have Ukrainians that are Russian speaking who don't even speak Ukrainian. Yeah. You have Ukrainians that are Ukrainian speaking who don't speak Russian. You have Ukrainians that speak both Russian and Ukrainian. And each of those groups has questions and concerns about the other. Now, that being the case, I think there's real cause for excitement and joy internal to the Ukrainian and Russian churches. You know, definitely this is not a situation where uh, Voice of the Martyrs Korea is stepping in and intervening from the outside. What we're really doing is simply supporting the Christians who are there and the efforts that are underway uh, to, 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 to recognize the, the primacy of our heavenly citizenship and to 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 in to to really practice charitable judgment as the bible commands us to do so for example there have been recent meetings that have occurred at denominational levels between these countries in third countries as now the leaders of these denominations are saying man we got to stop this conflict you know between each other how can there be peace between our countries if there's no peace between our churches you know especially as protestants and so there are meetings that are underway. We should pray for those, and we're seeing good, positive results. The other thing is, is that the heroes in God's story, as you know, Greg, are, are all pretty much, pretty often, not the guys who are in the biggest pulpits or not the guys who are leading denominations. They're, they're the people who, other from the world standpoint, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, that they aren't particularly, you know, right. good social position, not particularly high up in their denomination, don't have a lot of money. And so here, what I do is I point to the fact that since 2014, in the the Russia-occupied areas of Ukraine called the Donbas region, these pastors, which has, that area has traditionally been a a hot spot of evangelism and and Protestantism in Ukraine. So since 2014, you know, let's look at it like this. At, At the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were enjoying this amazing revival. They were even sending out literally high school girls who had just graduated. They, 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 the congregations would take up a collection, buy one-way tickets, and send them literally to Siberia to plant churches. So that's why you see so many churches in Siberia that were planted by Ukrainians, even amazing. Ukrainian yeah. high school girls. So, I mean, there was this amazing revival. And at that time, Western missionaries, South Korean missionaries all came in and they said, man, we got to help you build church buildings. We got to, you know, um, uh, help you register legally, so you have non NGO, you know, nonprofit or NGO status. We have to, uh, you know, um, um, we have to set up seminaries because you know you can't run these these new big church buildings with high school girls. So they did all that, and what happened was the revival ended, and the church entered into a period of stagnancy and then decline. But in 2014, when Russia invaded that area. Then what happened was the first thing they did is they needed a place to quarter their soldiers. They looked around and they found these giant buildings with crosses on top. The the buildings even had coffee shops inside them. They were the churches that had been built in partnership with Western and South Korean Christians. And the Russian army said, these these will be great places to quarter our soldiers. They cut the crosses off the top of these Protestant churches and they, they moved in and they're still there. They, they, they recognized that uh, the, the greatest challenge to the authority of the Russian Orthodox Church and, the, and, and potentially the Russian government was Protestants who were connected with denominations outside of Ukraine and Russia. So fortunately, they had a list because, of course, South Koreans and Westerners had helped them register. So they could take the official list, go through names, addresses, and they would interrogate these guys, electrocute them, torture them. And so then the same thing, they shut down all the seminaries. But an amazing thing happened, Greg, was once the, all those externals were once again removed, you know what happened? Revival returned. <laughs> and so once again, it, w- it wasn't churches and buildings with names that were legally registered with pastors who came from seminaries. It was it was old women. It was high school girls. It was handicapped men leading small groups of Christians from house to house to house. And those are the people who we've turned to and 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 they've been leaders 
in sharing with other Ukrainian churches how they've managed since 2014 to continue to be faithful witnesses to the gospel, showing, of course, love for their country, but showing, of course, preference for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I think that's the exciting thing, Greg. These are the, the, the people who, when we, we've done these training events with Ukrainian and Russian Christians, and we and we brought them together. And you know who leads those is these Christians who, you know, they're they're not seminary educated, they're not leaders of their denomination, they're nobodies in the world's eyes. But man, they can tell you how they've survived and how they've been faithful to God in this context. And man, I don't have anything to teach. I just shut up and listen. I say, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, right. He's right, absolutely. And so that's really a voice of the martyrs Korea's role. You know, of course, we we try to you know, as they see things that we can teach on, whether conflict resolution, theology of persecution. Uh, my wife, Dr. Hunsuk Foley, she specializes in, in trauma, Christian biblical-based trauma recovery. So we teach on those subjects, but really Ukrainians and Russians need to hear from other Ukrainians and Russians to hear voices that go even back to the Soviet era to say, look, this is how we did it. We were, you know, and this is what we often hear. They say, we know these things. We've just forgotten them. We need to remember them. We need to recover them. And so there is a lot of hope. It's 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 it looks on the one hand like chaos, but that's really only in, in, in at the macro level. God is always working at the micro level in ones and twos, right? With individual Christians who who often don't come up across the radar screen, and Ukraine and Russia are filled with them. They're paying, as as we said in in the piece with VOM Canada, they're paying a tax on faithfulness, which is is increasing these yeah. days. But that's only increasing the resolution for the gospel. So. Yeah, and that's the thing that uh, we we see that when the opposition comes, um, again, I believe that God does raise up people. And as you talk about yeah. that, that, we may not know their names until, uh, you know, we get to heaven with them, uh, you know, to hear how faithful they were. And again, when I, you know, as I'm listening to you talk, and of course, I'm reminded of other countries and where things are happening, when there's persecution, that, you know, often can lead to unity, it also can lead to division. So we don't know how this is all going to play out. But when you talk about this, you know, tax on faithfulness, do you see this happening for a while in Russia? Is this just ramping up? Or yeah. do you think they'll get distracted and uh, maybe move on to other things? Well, I would say this, Greg. Um it's we we would say that it's an accelerating trend and it shows no sign of abating it's broadening it's deepening and now it's covered very basic areas of the christian life it's not to say that it's absolute right and i think that's the that's the thing you can cite you know five we, we talked about five cases where it happened we can easily pick five cases where it didn't happen where people you know put out periodicals in their shop and didn't get in trouble so why is it enforced in certain places and not others a lot of that has to do with local authorities it has to do with denominational affiliation um and so there's a lot of factors at play but it's very clear that these are not simply isolated incidents they, because they represent a pattern that matches the official rhetoric of the government and of the Russian Orthodox Church that problematizes Protestantism and Protestant evangelistic and discipleship activity such that especially those people that are in, in um, groups that are not historically registered with the government that those groups face a lot of difficulty. Yeah. Or in the case of Russian occupied areas of Ukraine, uh, that the, 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 it's, it's not the unregistered churches that are facing difficulty, it's the churches who are registered, but they're registered with the Ukrainian government. And um, the Russian government is saying, well, we've, not we, we've noticed that you haven't yet re-registered. And so um, we'd like to understand why, and of course we're sure you want to, you know, re-register at the, at, at the, you know, the the city hall this afternoon. So you know, those are it's different by denomination, it's different by region, and so there's a lot of different situations, but they all have some basic elements in common, which is just that Christian nationalism uh, has united the Russian Orthodox Church and the aims of the Russian government in such a way that the, the problems facing pro Protestants are increasing and deepening and don't appear to be going away anytime soon. Well, we certainly need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Russia, and Eric will do that in just a moment. Uh, but before we leave the conversation, uh, got to get at least an update on North Korea. Yeah. We're going to have you back here uh, real soon on Close to the Fire to talk about what's happening there. But, you know, you see Kim Jong-un and his regime, they're continuing to test these missiles uh, to intimidate Japan and South Korea and, by extension, uh, the United States. You live in Seoul. 
Uh, how does this affect you know you personally, your family, coworkers, and and the South Korean people? Well, that you know the answer to that question also explains why we got involved with Russian Christians in the first place, which is when we started Voice of the Martyrs Korea 20 years ago to support underground North Korean Christians. We were reaching them not only inside North Korea, but wherever North Koreans were found. Mm. And there's so many North Korean laborers sent out to so many different countries, many of them in Russia and in China. So as we would reach those North Koreans in Russia and in China, our obvious partners for working together were Russian Christians and Chinese Christians. And so we started working together our North Korean ministry, but then those Russian and Chinese Christians said, hey, we need this for us too. You know, not just supporting North Korean Christians, but Russian Christians, Chinese Christians need to hear that. So um, I think the connection between the church in North Korea, China, Russia, you know, we, we talk about in general, the underground church, but that is true, Greg, that, 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 that Christians that face restrictions on oppositions, especially in the face of the government, and especially for reasons related to communism and totalitarianism, have a lot in common, and we do a lot of cooperative ministry. So the impact when it happens in one country is felt in many. So, for example, Russia and North Korea recently agreed to, that North Korea would send many laborers to the Donbass region of Ukraine. Well, that's very important because in the Donbass region of Ukraine, then Christians there are going to be facing North Koreans and wanting to share the gospel with them. We need to be able to help equip them to do that. North Korea has closed its borders since the beginning of the coronavirus. They haven't allowed their workers to return. That means that for, for now three years, workers have been stuck in Mongolia, uh, China, Southeast Asia, even Eastern Europe. Bad for them on the one hand, good for them from an eternal perspective, because it's given us three years of time to share the gospel with them and, and do discipleship and evangelism. So the recent changes in North Korea, um, the strengthening of ties with Russia and uh, the emergence of, of, uh, of, a, of an even deeper connection between Russia and China and North Korea to bust sanctions and, and, and now re reinforce and support new North Korean nuclear capabilities that very much has an impact on Christians because of the fact that it creates a whole new environment in which ministry is done. But as I noted, it doesn't, it's not always bad for Christians because North Korea's decision to close its borders has resulted in greater opportunities to evangelize. North Korea's decision to lock down vast parts of the country has meant many workers are at home. And so they're more interested in listening to the Christian radio broadcast. We had to add another radio broadcast in. The number of Bibles that we've distributed in uh, to North Koreans, uh, wherever they're found, has doubled each year of the pandemic because as North Koreans in Russia, China, and North Korea realize that those governments don't have solutions to COVID. And in fact, if you get sick as a North Korean worker, they don't pay for you to go to the hospital. They're saying, is there anybody I can rely on? And of course, the evangelist says, absolutely. The Lord is present and the Lord is present and powerful to heal and to save and protect. And so uh, we've seen an upsurge in activity. So COVID was not great for Western churches um, or, or the South Korean church. It was, however, a time of real growth for North Korean Christians, Russian Christians, and Chinese Christians. It's, it's paradoxical, isn't it? Well, God is in control. I think we always have to remember that. And it's not something we would, uh, you know, put up on the drawing board, Eric. Uh, mm -hmm. But God is concerned about, you know, people coming to know his son, Jesus. And so if they can't get into the country, they hear about Jesus. There's some time to disciple them. And then they go back into North Korea. Of course, they have to be very careful. But as really missionaries and evangelists to share the gospel. So what are some of the things that you're hearing out of North Korea uh you know, in terms of, the, and again, I know it's limited, call, you know, in terms of your communication, but you do hear things and I know your, you know, balloon launches are still happening and radio broadcasts and all the wonderful things that are going on. Uh, are you hearing good things in terms of the church in North Korea, which uh, is, you know, still one of the most dangerous places to follow Jesus? Yeah, absolutely, Greg. Uh, and just to note, of course, um, we're, our work is always, it, it's never from the outside in only, but so much of Voice of the Martyrs Korea really is what happens inside North Korea yes. with, with yes. our own team members there who are Christians who are, who, you know, we've had 38 martyrs in Voice of the Martyrs Korea in the last 20 years, men and women laying down their lives primarily inside North Korea for this work. So, um, but if we were to ask the question, where is the church growing faster in North Korea or South Korea? The answer is clearly North Korea. 
since 1989, the church has been in numeric decline every year in South Korea. So people, Christians think of South Korea and they say, wow, 10 of the 11 largest churches in the world, sending out more missionaries than anybody. True, true. However, the church has been in numeric decline every year. During COVID, those missionaries were called back in large numbers. And so uh, we, we saw upwards of 15% of churches closing or uh, at risk of closure still in, in the near future. In North Korea, we didn't have a single church close uh, due to COVID, right? We, what we saw was an expansion, a spreading of the gospel. Uh, the, you know, we have both the testimonials, which Voice of the Martyrs Canada is so faithful to let us share. Um, but in addition to that, there's cold hard facts that I think it's important to remember from independent organizations like the North Korean Human Rights Database, secular organization, human rights organization, not a Christian organization, completely independent. But every year they do studies on each of the aspects of human rights and including religious freedom. And they've been doing that since the year 2000. Well, in the year 2000, as they would talk and they would gather information from inside North Korea, from North Koreans abroad and from North Korean defectors. In the year 2000, they found that for all intents and purposes, 0% of North Koreans inside of North Korea had seen a Bible with their own eyes. It's actually like 0.0006% yeah, at that time. Yeah, really, really minuscule, yeah. Yeah, but but in the most recent survey data, which comes from the year 2021, it's like the census, there's always a lag you know, between when the data is analyzed mm -hmm. and it's published. But as of December 2021, about 8% of North Koreans had seen a Bible with their own eyes. That's, that's a staggering number. It's upwards of 2 million in a country where to see a Bible with your own eyes is to court execution. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I'm saying. These are not just isolated testimonies. But th th there's there's good, solid evidence to show that the, the church continues to grow and thrive in North Korea. It enjoys no public acceptance or tolerance. Christian activity is just as dangerous as it's ever been. There are new challenges. You know, sometimes people say, uh, oh, you guys, always, you say it's bad and then you say it's worse. How can it be bad but then worse? Well, what happens is that things change. So it's, it's new challenges. So, for example, North Korea has acquired from its it's 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 other partner governments better technology to track and intercept cell phone signals it means that whereas it used to take them longer period of time to be able to, to tap into a call now they can do it more quickly mm -hmm. why does that matter it matters because the front line of north korean ministry isn't the border between china and north korea it is it is in the city of seoul where 60% of North Korean defectors maintain regular monthly contact with their relatives in North Korea, primarily by cell phone. Sure, yeah. And so when North Korea can tap into those calls sooner, we have to learn how to share the gospel more quickly. We have to, we, we have to change the way that we train. The biggest change I think that happened, Greg, was in, uh, in our work was in March 2021, when not only balloon launching became criminalized in South Korea, but any movement of, um, uh, of anti, what is considered anti-North Korean material northward uh, across the border, including Greg, via the internet, became a criminal activity. Only radio was excluded from that. But what that means is that it's not only Russia and China blocking the, the influx of, of Bibles and Christian literature into North Korea. There is now no country it is there's no country where 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 that is not a crime i realize it's a double negative let me flip it around and say this. yeah yeah there's there's no legal means to bring bibles and christian literature into north korea from any direction in any medium in any way period All right the only thing that we still can do legally is radio so now if you were to say well what is voice of the mars korea doing of course we would say well you know, we, we never comment publicly on our, our field activities in terms of the specific details of them, other than to say that Voice of the Martyrs continues to get Bibles into North Korea through a wide variety of means, and uh, that we joyfully and willingly pay the price that we have to pay personally in each of the countries that we do that. And, uh, you know, it's not just North Korea, it's China, Russia, and South Korea. You know, as I, as, as I found out personally in June 2020, when I was arrested and charged with three charges related to balloon launching work. And ultimately, praise God, those charges were dis uh, not, sorry, they weren't dismissed. Um, they, the, the charges were not pressed, if that makes sense. So in other words, okay. uh, I, I can still be um, uh, 
uh, I can still be uh, brought to trial for those charges at a later time. It's it's a difficult thing to try to explain the South Korean justice system, but let's just say that um, that there's no such thing as being in the free and clear when it comes to these kinds of activities. So right. we have to be judicious. You know, our our what we say is, of course, we obey the law, except where it directly contravenes what what Christ commands us to do. But even there, we willingly and joyfully pay whatever the cost is, and the tax on faithfulness is going up here too. Yeah, I mean, it is a difficult uh, situation in all these places. I mean, yeah. uh, you picked it. Well, I mean, every nation has its issues. But I mean, these ones that you're talking about, China, Russia, North Korea, when you factor in, you know, the human rights violations, their nuclear countries. I mean, there are so many things that are going on. But yet we're always reminded. And, and anytime I talk to you, I'm reminded that God yeah. is working in the midst of some of the most difficult dangerous and uh, divisive times even, but uh, God is working and people are coming to know Jesus. So yeah. that, that's a, that's an amazing thing. Um, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to have you back. We'll talk more about North Korea. We'll keep updated on the situation in Russia. Uh, I'd like you to pray for Russia and North Korea. Uh, before we do that, Eric, is there anything else you'd like to add? Greg, I think the, um, the one thing I would say is just that um, when we actually really look at the data and the details of what's happening, uh, what we can see is, is that um, the opposition to the gospel is constant, but it's always changing. It, it changes its face. It changes its type. And so why it's important for people to continue to listen to your broadcast, read the Voice of the Martyrs Canada newsletter, check out the website, is it's not just enough to say, oh, Christians are suffering in North Korea. Let's pray for them. Oh, it's a hard thing to be a Christian in China. Let's pray. What we're saying is, is that each, literally every day brings new challenges. And the church is required to adapt. So even, for example, in North Korea, where the gospel continues to grow, Christians continue to die every month and new baby Christians are born. And we have to pray that those Christians can take the place of, of those martyrs who laid down their lives. So I think what happens, Greg, is when we don't get into the details, if all we do is hear an occasional testimony or story, but we really don't dig into understanding why and we don't pray knowledgeably, We'll just say things like, oh, yeah, it's bad there. Yeah, we should pray that it gets better. And we miss, for example, how God uses those situations to accomplish his purpose in ways that can build our faith. But we also miss the importance of praying for these real Christians on a daily basis who are facing new challenges. So North Korea is, even though people say, yeah, it's been bad forever. It's been different kinds of bad every day. <laughs> it just changes. So, so let's stay with Voice of the Martyrs Canada and really um, listen to what's happening. Not only North Korea, China, Russia, but in all the countries. You know, persecution is not a steady state. It all comes from the same place. However, it takes on different forms, and Christians have to be wise as as, as serpents in addressing them and and facing these new challenges in the strength of Christ every day. You know, when I'm speaking in churches, Eric, I encourage people to get the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. Uh, you know, it's not only stories of persecution, but it's also stories of incredible victory and faithfulness. Yeah. We, we need to hear that in the West as, you know, we're now facing, uh, you know, many challenges as we see, you know, Canada, the United States, the Western world falling further and further, you know, from biblical principles. And it's causing a lot of angst in people. And, you know, the church is struggling in some ways. And then in other ways, I see how God is working. And even a local church that I attend have seen it grow over COVID. And there's this enthusiasm with young people. So God is working and we're, you know, encouraged by that. But when I'm speaking at church, so you know, yeah, you need to get the magazine. We have what's called the Persecution Prayer Alert that comes out every Thursday. You can get it on your email. Print it off and be praying mm -hmm. for our brothers and sisters rather than sort of this generic prayer. And, and again, I, any prayer is good. But, you know, Lord, be with the persecuted believers in North Korea. Okay, yes. But find out the stories. Hear more about what's going on. You know, praying for the work of the Voice of the Martyrs Korea and those that are working in these places. Because when we see their faces, when we hear their stories, again, I know it's a little more difficult from North Korea, you know, real names and faces, but still, God knows them. And we investigate. And, and as you said, things are changing. You know, I work a lot in the Muslim world. And, you know, you, th you see things happening in Nigeria. Nigeria with groups like the Boko Haram and how that is expanding. You've got other groups now, the Fulani herdsmen in it. And you think, oh, I can't, I can't understand all this. Well, the reality is there's so many things going on. And so what I always encourage people to do is, you know, take a country, take a whatever it might be, and to be praying 
as intelligently as you can. And what it does in our own spirit is it strengthens us to be strong in our faith and not to compromise. So I think that, you know, I love what you guys do. I mean, you're a friend and I appreciate all that, you know, the partnership that we've had. I've seen your work uh, in, uh, you know, in Seoul and and beyond and how God is using Voice of the Martyrs Korea. And, uh, you know, these are exciting days. They're dangerous days. People are dying. That's the reality. People are imprisoned and tortured. But God is working, and uh, so we talk about prayer. Let's uh, let's do that, Eric. If you could yes. lead us to be praying for uh, the situation in Russia, and this will give us some ideas as well, and how we can more effectively pray for you know what is going on there in Ukraine and and also North Korea. So if you can lead us, brother, Father God, in the name of Jesus, it's at the time that we're recording this. It's um, Friday morning here, and in North Korea, Christians are having to walk by the 40,000 statues of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il on the way to work and having to face the decisions of what do they do uh, when authorities are present and do they bow and uh, do they uh, do they repeat the, the, the slogans praising the leader almost as a God in the workplace that they're required to do. Lord, these are real decisions that are real Christians making every moment of every day. And in Russia, uh, Protestants who, who simply want to share their faith, putting out simple newsletters, uh, now have to deal with the reality that they, they could face court fines and even worse punishments uh, simply to do that basic evangelism. In China, Christians uh, are finding that even though now uh, they're on the other side of uh, COVID and it's beginning to abate, that the, the government is still applying all those restrictive technologies and uh, meeting together now becomes an even greater challenge than it was before COVID. So we don't want to pray for countries, Lord. We really want to pray for individual Christians. We want to pray for individual Christians who are making individual decisions at this moment that we are praying. And we're just praying specifically for them. Give them wisdom to know how to honor you in each of these situations. Help them, Lord. Show them how uh, they can still honor your command to gather together and not forsake their gathering. Lord, um, we pray that you would keep them safe uh, from harm for the sake of harm, for sure. But we pray, Lord, uh, that they would consider it all joy uh, to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Lord, we pray as the, 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 the most mature generation of Christians is martyred in North Korea. We pray for the new baby Christians who have to grow in that environment. In China, Lord, with more and more of the great church leaders imprisoned in long prison sentences. We're praying, Lord, because you're shifting the leadership of the church to the countryside, uh, to women, to farmers, uh, to handicapped people, to illiterate people. And this pleases you, Lord, because in 1 Corinthians 1, that's how you said you love to work. And in Russia, Lord, and in Ukraine, our brothers and sisters are at war, literally, with each other. And we know, Lord, that that... Um, is not your plan for us. We know that you've fitly compacted us together in the body of Christ that our greatest allegiance is to you. Yes, Jesus. And so we pray, Lord, for a wisdom that we do not have. We don't, we, we simply can't be armchair theologians and, 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 and uh, strut out easy answers to these questions, Lord. We're just humble before you. And we just pray that you'll continue to pour out your wisdom as we've seen you do through these, you know, from the world's eyes, nobody's, but the people who are great in your kingdom and in places like the Donbass, uh, as they now become leaders, uh, voices for you, prophetic voices, really, uh, sharing what you would have them share. So Lord, um, bless the Christians in these countries. Bless the ones who at this moment are in the time of trial. Uh, shorten it, Lord, because you said, unless it was shortened, we couldn't bear it because of our human limitations. Prepare those, Lord, who you know are to enter trial. And Lord, take our prayers and let the Holy Spirit use them and, and correct them and um, reword them because he, he, he only He, the Holy Spirit, knows the depth of your plan and your heart. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, to simply say, we're going to pray for all of these things, but we're going to go with your plan because your plan is even better. So we pray, Lord, that you would put believers in Russia, China, and North Korea on the heart of Canadian Christians constantly. And that um, we would remember the command of Hebrews 13, 3. Um, it, it's not just that we act 
Lord, as though we are related. It's that we recognize that you've made us related. It's the blood of Christ that now courses through our spiritual veins. And, and that's one blood, one nation, one church, one people, which is your holy nation, uh, the church. And so Lord, um, bless Canadian Christians with this burden uh, to pray for their brothers and sisters and um, to not be at rest um, in, until their brothers and sisters are safely home with you. Uh, we pray this in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I like what you said there too, Eric, about, you know, sometimes our, our words are inadequate. And yeah. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is, yeah, that's when Paul's talking in Romans 8, you know, even with, with groaning, we don't even know what to pray. Um, yeah. but, you know, when we come before our Father in heaven, uh, he he sees our hearts and, and our hearts need to continue to be soft uh, because we're a part of this wonderful family, the family of God. Uh, Eric, always so good to see you. Thank you so much. And and Eric Foley is the CEO and co-founder of the Voice of the Martyrs Korea and a good friend of the Voice of the Martyrs Canada. We have a long relationship and friendship. Yes. And I'm going to put your website on the episode notes and also the link to that article, uh, Russia Evangelical Believers Paid a Rising Tax on Faithfulness. It's an excellent article. Give us a better understanding, uh, you know, what is going on there. And we'll continue to follow what's happening in Russia. And uh, also, if I can encourage you listening or watching, if you could rate this podcast or write a review, tell your friends about it. Uh, so more people will discover uh, what we're doing at Closer to the Fire. And it's not about, uh, you know, th this ministry or any other ministry. It's about praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering and also to support them. So again, I thank you for those that are listening and are watching. And again, Eric, thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you real soon. God bless you, Greg. God bless all of our um, brothers and sisters in Canada, especially our Voice of the Martyrs Canada friends. Wow, you've got lots of friends here and we love you, brother. And remember, the closer you are to Jesus, the closer you are to the fire.